We have uh, Ryan, we have with us Tom, we have Aaron, and there's one more already stuck in traffic. Uh, you may have experienced this as well uh, this week. And uh, I'd like to give the word to Tom to kick off the first talk about the issues uh, since DEF CON 5. Take it away. Hi, I'm Ryan Lackey. I've been a cypherpunk since the early 1990s. Uh, started the world's first offshore data haven company, Haven Co. on Sealand in the North Sea. Uh, did defense contracting, building satellite and, and uh, cellular networks in conflict zones for a while. And then I started as CISO at a bunch of crypto projects. Uh, I'm currently CISO, a Chief Security Officer at Evertos Insurance, a crypto asset insurance company where I see a bunch of interesting risk events happen. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, we have an hour. Yes. Wow. I mean, there have been a lot of security incidents, so I guess we have plenty to talk about, but I just realized we have a full hour. Uh, hey, guys. I'm Lane. Very excited to be here. Um, I have been kind of steeped in hacker culture and hacker ethos since a pretty young age, uh, kind of high school, 14, 15 years old, um, specifically kind of penetration testing, white hat hacking, ethical hacking, this kind of stuff. Um, I, so kind of fast forwarding to the present, um, I was an Ethereum core developer with the Ethereum Foundation for a couple of years, um, and for the past three years have been working on a project which is a new layer one blockchain called Space Mesh uh, based on a novel consensus mechanism. So I currently lead R&D at that project and just generally kind of follow the security ecosystem very closely, um, contribute to you know, kind of security response here and there and, and just think deeply about it in the context of my work at Space Mesh. Nice to meet you all. My name is Arun. Uh, I've been a uh, full stack developer at uh, Bug Bounty Hunter for a few years and just generally like a very active uh, DeFi DJed. I was previously lead developer at a Web3 security uh, like related startup called Anti.Finance, and I'm currently head of research at Marana Ventures. Uh, and before crypto, uh, I was uh, a scientist uh, in systems biology, where I did research in high throughput protein sequencing. And uh, Tom Howard, who's currently stuck in traffic, is the founder of uh, DeFi payments wallet, uh, Monsendo, uh, crypto op options exchange power trade, uh, he's an unreformed DeFi degenerate, uh, angel investor, and he's now got a newly formed seed fund, Network Zero. Uh, he's working on building tools and infrastructure to support the network state concept that Balaji uh, developed as sort of a successor to the nation state. So there's a whole bunch of uh, security incidents that have happened in the last three years. Um, the world was very different in 2019, and I'm sure we've all, we can all remember <laughs> how things have, have changed. Uh, I think there's some, some broad categories that we're going to discuss um, of things that have happened, broken down by category, and then hopefully for 10 or 20 minutes toward the end, our views of how things are going to get better because the current state is terrifying. Like I, I uh, wonder how people who have um, very large fractions of their net worth in, these, in projects locked on, the, on chain sleep soundly every night. Uh, I certainly don't, and uh, it's probably something that... Uh, that, that can't, is not sustainable in its current level of vulnerability over time. Um, so uh, I think to start with, uh, one of the things I've noticed over the past like uh, at least 12 years in the overall crypto industry is a lot of the vulnerabilities that we're seeing in crypto are actually old vulnerabilities that were um, either core internet infrastructure or fundamental to human nature. They're not things that are really novel and new to any of these protocols. They're a whole class of things. They're like um, uh, insider threats, personnel issues, key management, um, leaky abstractions, uh, uh, bugs, versioning, things like that. So there's a whole range of things that we've seen that, that have really affected people. And I think some of the incidents that we can talk about uh, clearly fall into that. Um, I mean, there's a bunch that I can think of, but if either of you have any uh, that you can think of that come off, off the top of your head. Specific incidents? Or... Specific incidents and then the, the kind of vulnerability it was. So uh, I think it could be interesting, if you want to go this direction, to kind of do sort of a taxonomy because there are so many different buckets. I mean, there's at least kind of three or four different buckets, and you touched upon a couple of them right now. Some of them are social engineering related. Some of them are bugs in the code. Uh, another bucket is... Um, multi-sigs where kind of like your, your vanilla bridge exploit where you know one or more kind of keys were compromised. Um, from where I sit, the most interesting of these is kind of low-level 
um, bugs in sort of low-level libraries that, are, that, that, that live there, that lurk there for years, and, and they're not discovered until the whole world blows up. So the, the most obvious and salient example of this is the, the Binance hack that just happened a few days ago. Right? That was like a very low-level library, and it's kind of, in retrospect, incredible that it, it was there for years. And that code is used not only in the Binance ecosystem, but also in the Cosmos ecosystem. And Cosmos kind of got off lucky, luck, very luckily in this case, because the, the, the vulnerability wasn't present there in the same fashion. Um, I don't know. We could dig into one of these, or we could do a taxonomy, whatever direction you think is the best way to go. That's my oh. favorite category of vulnerability. <laughs> yeah, actually, just to like jump on that point before we move on, uh, yeah, it's really important to, to realize that this code is very complicated, and it's very new. Actually, Vitalik gave a great talk uh, a couple of days ago talking about bringing rollups online. Uh, so I believe it was the, uh, the optimism uh, fraud proof. Uh, I think it was the get node, actually. It's about 34,000 lines of, of new code. Any, and any small bug in that code could lead to potentially billions of dollars being lost. So how do we bring these like, very complex pieces of software online that are securing billions of dollars in kind of a safe and sustainable way? And, uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to exploring that question, uh, Jerry. Yeah, I, I'm happy you mentioned this. So, like, I'll try to share a little bit about what the world looks like from the perspective of a core developer, right, who worked on Ethereum previously. You know, this is relevant in the context of my work on Space Mesh, and I think just any core developer. We have this notion of a TCB. TCB means trusted compute base. And what it means is that there is some amount of code which is 100% critical to the functioning of the network, and any bugs or vulnerabilities or exploits in this, inside the trusted compute base are kind of apocalyptic, right? They're kind of like, like stop the world scenarios, like, like many of the exploits we're talking about here. And this is not new to crypto. It's not new to Web3, right? This concept has existed forever. It's present in operating systems and things like this. But as a core developer, touching upon what you said a moment ago about kind of the diff, you know, looking at the changes that Optimism has had to make to existing code like GoEthereum or, you know, any, anyone building, um, let's say, modifying or tweaking or adding on to existing code. Like, this is, this is what keeps us up at night as core developers. We want those changes to be as small as possible, those diffs, ideally, to be on the order of, like, tens of lines rather than hundreds or thousands of lines, because every one of those represents a very real possibility of the introduction of a bug. Right? Uh, another principle of computer science is that there's no such thing as bug-free code. It doesn't matter how good of an engineer you are. It doesn't matter how good your software engineering practices are. There's some number. And you can reduce it. Right? You can reduce the uh, incidence of bugs by following best practices, which, again, have existed for decades, things like code reviews, pair programming. There's various techniques. But it can only go so low. I think Microsoft or someone did research on this a decade ago and found that the most senior, most experienced programmers are still introducing one bug for every 1,000 lines of code, period. One bug for every 1,000 lines of code. Go Ethereum is probably on the order of 100,000 lines of code, right? And let's say some of those bugs have been found, but there's still bugs there for sure. So anyway, it's just as, as, a, as a comment, as a core developer, like this is literally what keeps us up at night. We want to minimize the number of changes. And that's very, very difficult when we want to add features and bells and whistles, you know, add new opcodes to our VM. Um, what's another good example? Uh, a lot of blockchains are using WebAssembly as a VM now. This is actually what I worked on in Ethereum, um, this thing called eWASM, which was a candidate to replace EVM uh, after, after the merge. Um, WebAssembly is a whole complex ecosystem, and if we start putting WebAssembly-based smart contracts on chain, then all of a sudden, the compilers and uh, interpreters for WebAssembly are now inside the trusted compute base. So you've added 100,000 lines of code or something to your trusted compute base. So one, I'm jumping ahead here, but one potential mitigation strategy is to like really minimize the number of changes, the number of things you add, minimize the size of your trusted compute base. Uh, on that front, I mean, the, the concept of a TCB is something that I read about in the Rainbow Books that were the, the NSA's security guides back in like the, they were written in the 80s. So this is a, a very well understood concept in theoretical computer security. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of theoretical because a lot of systems, there's, there's two classes of errors here. One, there's bugs in your TCB. Two, there's not identifying what really is the scope of your TCB correctly. There's a lot of the, the craziest things I've seen, like uh, the, the Yuga, Yuga hack, where a moderator's uh, account recovery credentials for a Discord server were essentially um, used to cause uh, like 200 like a crazy, like multi multi billion or multi million dollar loss. Uh, it was like two hundred million dollars or something like that. Um, 
So, the, uh, yes. Uh, there was someone, yeah, there, no, there was, I mean, these things happen, you know, in, in, in all companies and all industries, but it, just, just your point about credentials being stolen, this is what happened with that massive, I think it was Uber, right, about, about a year ago or something. Someone got credentials of an administrator via social engineering and then got inside the Slack and got inside, you know, yeah, so we have to be careful of this stuff too. Yeah, this has actually happening in, in crypto quite a bit. Uh, now mostly with, with Discord and Twitter. Um, actually, Zach XPT uh, a couple weeks ago had like a really interesting Twitter thread talking about someone having access to uh, an admin Twitter panel, and basically that was what allowed them to take over all these prominent Twitter accounts. Yeah, I think one of the, the main issues is we're using essentially consumer tools like Discord, Telegram, Twitter, things like that for large financial applications, and um, the people supporting the applications that we're using are not building them for the use case they're being used for. They were built for gamers talking to each other about um, progress in a game and things like that. So expecting them to provide the level of security needed for a trillion dollar ecosystem for security just doesn't make sense. And it's unfair to them to, to really blame them in any way. And uh, we need better tools. We need better tools. It's interesting. I think I agree very strongly with what Ryan just said. The situation has gotten a little bit better. Pretty much everything has two-factor authentication now. And if you ask any CISO, any security expert in the world, what's the one thing you can and should and must do immediately to increase security? It's not only enable, but force two-factor authentication on everyone. Um, so it's a little better than it was like five, 10 years ago, like when Discord didn't previously have two-factor authentication. Now they do, and I think, it's, I think it may even be on by default. Um, but I guess I'm kind of, I'm curious. I don't know the answer to this. Do we think that those tools that we use to coordinate, communicate, et cetera, need to be custom built? Or do we think that we can adapt existing tools to those purposes? Yeah, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel. If we could take from the, let's say, 50 plus years of security research in Web 2 and adapt it to Web 3, uh, yeah, I, that's no brainer. We definitely should do that. Yeah, I mean, I think most of Web 3 security is actually Web 2 security. So these lessons have already been learned by enterprise users. Uh, I would go a bit further than just saying two-factor. I think we should be using single sign-on hardware keys that are not fishable. Like the whole concept of uh, getting hacked because one of your emails clicks on an email and goes to the wrong URL, or is messaged something unsolicited on Telegram instead of Signal, or Telegram instead of Discord, where they routinely come with, with someone, go to a URL that's a phishing URL, click on something, and then boom, you're out $500 million is crazy. Like that's the vulnerability of the system, not of the individual that clicks on a link. And the, the idea of mandatory phishing training for users is woefully inadequate for protecting your systems. If it's possible to have a button that you push you, right next to another button that you push every single day, and you push the wrong button and it destroys the world, like the problem is not the person pushing the buttons, the problem is the person who designed the buttons and put them there. So uh, you really need to have uh, single sign-on so you can revoke credentials for an employee. If an employee here, like it's very common to have a laptop lost in a bar or have a a cell phone stolen, which might be unlocked and things like that, you want to be able to immediately revoke everybody's admin credentials. So I think essentially if you have administrative credentials for any project, which includes public, publishing to social media, um, doing any sort of action on treasury, anything like that, uh, and you don't have the ability to revoke those credentials remotely on loss in a single, uh, like, in a, like five minutes after the event is reported, uh, you are making a big mistake. And if it's possible for a user to go to the wrong URL by accident or by phishing, and um, lose their keys or use their keys incorrectly, you're also making a big mistake. So single sign-on and a hardware-enforced um, key credentialing are the way to go. But luckily, the, the broader security industry has largely accepted that, and we now have things like pass keys on iOS, and we have uh, like the, the FIDO2 ecosystem and everything else. So the key management in the traditional enterprise security world is getting a lot better. Uh, we also have great um, open source SSO tools as well as commercial tools. So, so that world is getting better, but the, the problem, one of the biggest problems with security is the um, the attacker can find any vulnerability. The defender needs to be protected against everything. And you get a lot of cases where, I mean, everyone knows as a, as a team, like you have a certain number of hours in a week for your, your people, and you want to spend your resources on building the product. Because if your company fails, if your project fails, no one uses it because you don't have any features. That's, that's also very bad. So um, if you have one hour to spend, you probably want to spend that on working on your product and not locking down security. So there's a lot of cases where the, uh, the floor of security is not uniformly high enough floor, there's a, a vulnerability and things like that. So I think making tools better, making things secure by default is really the solution there. 
So one thing I want to touch on with adapting Web 2 security practices to Web 3 is that one thing we have in Web 3, the other Web 2, is these systems need to be uh, sensor persistent. And that's like a very important factor. And that's one reason why MetaMask doesn't have 2FA. I mean, part of the reason is also because of the way EOAs work, and you, know, you can have multi-sigs with 2FA. But if you want like a non-custodial wallet built on top of the Ethereum platform, there is no real way to do uh, 2FA on the OA, you have to have a smart contract based wallet, which I think people are kind of moving towards in the future. But like one example would be, for instance, the Mango Market hack last night. Um, people always say after these DeFi hacks, well, why don't you have, let's say, like some kind of circuit breaker or something that says, okay, if you're trying to withdraw $50 million from the smart contract, maybe you have a human being involved in that process. And one reason why we might not want to do that, and I, I say with an asterisk, because uh, in the end, if any smart contract which has the ability for an admin deposit is not decentralized, so most smart contracts and most deeper protocols don't really have a true decentralization as of yet, and I think that's probably a good thing at this stage. But I, I guess, like, uh, assuming that, that that wasn't the case and the smart contract was truly decentralized, um, you can put a human being in that loop, because that introduces a point of attack for regulation and a point of attack for... Uh, for other kinds of compromises, like you mentioned. So how do we do this in a way which is, which is programmatic and sensitive persistent? So I think there are going to need, be, need to be some new design patterns in, in DeFi, and you know, there, there's things you could do. Like for instance, you could, uh, for instance, maybe even develop like an open Zeppelin kind of like smart contract library that, that kind of like meters and says, okay, like don't let you, you shouldn't be able to withdraw more than like $1 million worth of USDC every like hour or so, and I think that's, fairly reasonable, although maybe for sample cases it might not be. And it also might be difficult to do in a generalizable way, given that if you have, for instance, Oracle attacks, the smart contract might not necessarily know what the value of the assets being withdrawn are. So you need to be careful about, about that code. Yeah, I agree with that stuff. I mean, we're, we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit to like mitigations and solutions. Um, I'll just add one more comment on that, and then Ryan, you can steer us in one direction or another. But uh, so you know, the title of this talk is Notable Security Instance since, since DevCon 5. So obviously, if we're talking past three years. A lot has changed in the past three years. You know, three years ago, I would say best practices along the lines that you're describing were just emerging. They didn't really exist. We were still, at that point, struggling with basic things like reentrancy. And I think now we have a much better, what's that? We still are, yeah, we still are, this is true. <laughs> this will be a thing forever. Um, but you know, we have libraries that you can include now from people like Open Zeppelin that protect against common classes of attacks like reentrancy. That's just one example. Um, you know, basic things like not having ever a single point of failure, which is to say, like a single key pair or something, right? You and and as 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 he pointed out, you know, uh, externally owned accounts, which is to say, just simple basic key pair based accounts in Ethereum are a single point of failure. You lose the key, you're hosed. There's, there's, there's no getting it back. So having multi-signatures, um, having cool-off periods or delays, right, both for governance as well as any time you're moving funds, right, uh, having tiers so that you can kind of move a certain amount of funds instantly, but something over whatever that amount is, you know, requires a delay of two days, three days. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but the reason the DAO hack, the DAO of 2016, wasn't worse than it was. The reason that the, uh, the white hat hackers were able to recover the majority of the ETH was because there was a delay, actually multiple delays baked into the protocol, right? So it could have been far, far, far worse. Yeah, in general, you have the, the frequency of an attack, the potential value at risk, the amount that is actually stolen, which might be limited by all these other countermeasures, and then any sort of recovery procedures that are possible. And we've definitely seen a lot of progress in the last three years on both chain analysis and uh, a lot of other... You've... Ah, cool. Cool. Great. Okay. Uh, so we've seen a lot of um, uh, uh, positive uh, changes in the overall ecosystem where we have uh, um, now some chain analysis tools. We have a huge ecosystem of security audit and infrastructure um, existing in the world. We have probably hun hundreds of audit firms, both coming from the Web 2 world and dedicated to Web 3 smart contract audits. So a lot of these vulnerabilities are, are bugs in code, and um, I'd much rather find a bug in code in an audit that I've just paid a couple hundred thousand dollars for rather than in the wild. We also have more of a culture of bug bounties and reporting so if there is a bug found, I can legally make a couple million dollars as a bug bounty and be a good person and also build my own reputation, do it publicly, everything else, rather than just exploiting it and probably taking 20, 30 million dollars plus in dirty money and being a horrible person and uh, having to hide it and everything else and no one learning from it. 
Um, so there's a lot of, lot of positive changes that have happened. Uh, the counter argument to all this is just the whole ecosystem has continued to grow. So if a vulnerability affects 1% of the ecosystem, or if vulnerabilities affect 1% of the ecosystem, the total dollar amount and the total number of users affected just goes up as, as growth goes. Oh, um, yeah, just a couple quick thoughts to add to what Ryan said. The tooling that Ryan was alluding to has gotten really powerful. And, and a lot of it is open source, right? So like folks like Trail of Bits have multiple libraries, multiple tools that you can use to do inspection and analysis at, at various layers of the stack. And I would actually say, I, w I wonder if you guys agree with this, um, simply running these open source tools today will probably get you more than you would have gotten if you paid six or seven figures for an audit three years ago. Uh, so there's really powerful stuff. I mean, it's, it's depends on your, your threat model. Like, it may not be sufficient. You should still do audits, caveat emptor, but there are very powerful tools out there. Yes, yeah, Slither is quite nice. Um, one thing I want to say about the existing models is I do think they're, they're fairly sufficient. Like, I don't, I don't think that, uh, aside from a few auditing firms that have various stellar reputations, like, let's say, Trail of Bits or, or, or Didob, most times when I see an audit, I'm not necessarily thinking, like, oh, this code is safe, because we've seen many times that audits are, are, are faulty. Like, there are humans reviewing human code. People can miss bugs either way. And the other thing about bug bounties is actually that uh, the system is, is just not really working very well. Um, as a bug bounty, I can tell you, uh, ironically, it's often you make more money if you, if you hack the smart contract and then hold the funds for ransom and then keep 10% versus just reporting the bug, which is just insane. But. So that's an argument for possibly increasing the amount. Like, there's a whole calculus of if you offer people too much for um, reporting bugs, then you end up with uh, bugs get reported through that channel and possibly introduced. And you have, you have a problem. So I used to do security contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there was a concept of like paying people if uh, US forces caused a um, uh, uh, injury to someone or, or death. And there was a crazy, like I would obviously say you should pay as large amount of money as possible. But um, if you make that amount too much, there was an argument that people would intentionally cause innocence just to get the bounty, which is terrible, but um, you have the same risk with insiders. Like one of the whole categories that crypto companies do not address um, really at the level that traditional finance and everything else addresses is insider threat. You can have a team, if a team is a few people that have started a project together and have worked together for a long time, that's one level of trust. But if you've got a team that's hundreds of people, you're hiring people using like LinkedIn and whatever else, somebody joins, you don't really know uh, what people's motivations are. They could be um, incompetent, they could be nation state affiliated, they could be um, criminal affiliated, everything else. They may introduce bugs intentionally and then um, exploit them. They may discover something in the course of their work and then pass it off to a friend externally who exploits it. There's all sorts of stuff like that. Traditional finance solves this by having separation of duties, so no single person would ever be able to um, have a vulnerability that would, uh, ideally, that would be able to exploit things. But that isn't really compatible with an ecosystem where stuff is being built as you're, as you're going. Uh, you, you have a trade-off. Basically, you can build new stuff or you can uh, prioritize for extreme safety and resilience against this kind of insider threat. And uh, I don't think it would be good for the ecosystem if we became so paranoid that we didn't allow innovation. Um, so, yeah. Ryan, our final speaker has arrived for your panel. Yeah. Come on, come on down. Welcome, welcome. Sorry about that, learning about Bogota traffic this morning, getting DDoSed on the road. Um, cool, yeah, I'm Tom. Uh, I founded a, a DeFi product called Mosendo uh, a few years ago, uh, focused on DeFi payments. I uh, also co-founded a crypto options exchange, uh, which is a centralized exchange that dealt, dealt a lot with custodial risk, and then have been an investor in the space for a while and just started a seed fund called Network Zero. So uh, I've actually been following the Mango Markets hack, uh, even on the ride over here. There's some in interesting developments. It'll be interesting to get to at some point. You can share my bit. And so one other point just before we move on was the the interesting argument about decentralization, the Binance hack that happened a couple days ago, they were able to mitigate their loss because they were able to just stop their chain, which is crazy from a centralization perspective, but did save them $900 million. So that's the counter argument against uh, proper decentralization. Also, the hacker bridged some of that money into USDC, which immediately got frozen. Which is a centralized stable coin, so yes. yes.
Um, so yeah. Okay. So actually, for that Binance has specifically, uh, I would argue that was certainly chain sovereignty is an important factor, and social consensus is an important factor of mitigating loss for sure. And that's something that, for instance, protocols which have strong bridges to Ethereum don't have, because if that Ethereum bridge is hacked, basically they have no ability to roll back changes on Ethereum to recover that money. But with the Binance hack in particular, the hacker had about three hours to wreak havoc, and he didn't. So that was almost like an issue of hacker incompetence. I think that Binance could have lost quite a bit more if the hacker was a bit more competent in that situation. Yeah, one of the things that I think Tom's a particular expert in is a lot of the DeFi vulnerabilities, which in a weird way are some combination of software bugs and economic vulnerabilities. And figuring out exactly what's what in that space is difficult. The, the main value of, of having a taxonomy is because you can then identify trends and underlying risks and assess them. So it, I don't know if it's worth trying to figure out which of these assets, which of these risks are more economic versus more software bugs and how to mitigate those. But if you want to talk about some of the DeFi issues that you've seen over the last three years. Yeah, have we gone over flash loan attacks yet? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. No, oh, excellent. Uh, so I find that very interesting because it's like this novel attack that no one imagined. Uh, this, and this has it's not, not possible in any other ecosystem, right? It's not, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, and it's new since the last DevCon, right? Uh, flash loans only came into existence in late 2019, early 2020. Yeah. And then you had the first uh, flash loan attack happen in ETH November 2020 in February. Yep. Uh, I remember the BZX team being quite excited about their product, and then that day they got flash loan attacked. And it, 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 I, I like to not assume a ton of prior knowledge. It might be worth explaining what a flash loan is and what uh, a flash loan sure, attack yes. is, just as a starting point. <laughs> okay, yeah. So flash loans, um, flash loans are interesting, and actually, you probably only hear about them in negative context, but they're actually a net positive for the ecosystem. They're actually very useful. So flash loan basically allows you to borrow a nearly unlimited sum of money without having any money yourself. Uh, but you have to do it within a single transaction. So at the end of the transaction, say there's multiple lines that make up a, a transaction, you have to repay that loan at the end of it. So people use it a lot for arbitrage bots or uh, keeper bots, liquidation bots. These keep financial markets in order because a uh, coder who has the skills to run these things, but not the capital to, can use flash loans to say, borrow a million dollars to arbitrage a position across markets into place. So I, I like to say that Ethereum's superpower is composability, permissionless composability, right? The fact that you can build a smart contract that crawls into a smart contract, that crawls into a smart contract, kind of ad nauseum, you actually quite, quite a few layers deep. And yeah, flash loans are just a form of leverage, right? So they allow you to uh, pay a very small amount of interest. I mean, it probably amounts to thousands or tens of thousands of, of APY on an annualized basis, but because it's for the span of a single block time, a tiny amount of interest, and just, 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 just jack up to a very high level, a very high amount of leverage, the amount of funds you're moving around and using in that single transaction. And that can flow down. Some, some of the most sophisticated flash loans they touch dozens and dozens and dozens of different contracts. They go you know, 20, 30 layers deep. It's kind of fascinating to unpick them as a developer. Very. I just want to make a distinction between composability and, and atomicity, uh, because you can have composability over multiple transactions, but the atomicity of a transaction is, is what is the key distinction here with flash loans. Arun, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Yeah, just to kind of like uh, add a bit to that point. Um, What's about flash loans from a protocol perspective is basically riskless. I can lend out any money from my, my protocol and get repaid back by the end of the transaction. It gets rolled back, it's not repaid. Basically, there's no down to the protocol, and it makes the markets more efficient. But yeah, I, I think the issue is it, it, it provides like asymmetric ability for, for hackers to kind of wreak havoc. It, it's definitely like a very powerful tool. I remember at one point last year, DAI was considering having the ability for people to mint arbitrary amounts of DAI in a transaction and then repay it at the end of the transaction. And you can imagine just like what people could be capable of. They could just like mint billion DAI and then repay it in a transaction. That would be kind of insane. At least with the current flash loans, if the assets aren't in the smart contract, you can't use them. So there, there's only it's $100 million of USDC in a smart contract. I could only use $100 million of USDC. But if I could literally create like a trillion dollars of DAI out of thin air and then repay it, that's a lot more dangerous. 
Yeah, yeah, one of the, the issues is, you could certainly do this with, most of these exploits would be possible without the flash lens. You'd be able to, if you had a large pool of assets, uh, exploit something that requires a large pool of assets to exploit it. But the set of people who have a large pool of assets lying around is much smaller, and it's very hard to move $100 million on chain uh, anonymously, and then uh, the whole chain of moving stuff to and from and everything else. So this opens up to potentially any attacker in the world can, can exploit one of these vulnerabilities and not simply the people who have very large pools of capital lying around. So the, the key to these flash loan attacks is that you basically have one smart contract system which is doing imperfect accounting on some other smart contract system. And when they're coding it, they think, oh, nobody could ever possibly have that amount of money to manipulate th that imperfection. They make assumptions, but those assumptions are not checked, basically. Right. So after flash loans happen, I, I kind of view it as like the immune system of DeFi. Like, if coders are taking shortcuts and they're, they're taking these assumptions and being imprecise in their calculations, a flash loan attacker will eventually find it and exploit it. Um, so it, it actually encourages people to yeah. be more responsible with their coding practices. Yeah, and we were talking earlier about how much more mature things have gotten in the past three yeah. years since DevCon 4, basically. Or sorry, since oh, DevCon yeah. 5, sorry, this is DevCon 6. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it's like a fascinating category of, of attacks because uh, they're not exactly bugs. Like, right. code was kind of working as intended, right. Right. Uh, but like, yeah, they were able to get like insane amounts of leverage. Uh, the other way that the flash loan attacks are commonly used is for oracle manipulation. So uh, the most common attack is, uh, say you've got some protocol that uses some asset as a collateral, uh, and say that collateral uh, actually has very illiquid markets and maybe it's only one Uniswap market. Uh, so they can use the flash loan to just wind up that market to pump up the value of that collateral uh, deposit that collateral into, say, some sort of lending market, and then withdraw um, assets against the value of that collateral. And then they unwind that because they have to repay their flash loan, and so that um, collateral becomes worthless again. Um, so that's been a, another common vector of attack, but that's been, uh, there's ways to mitigate that um, with, instead of using a, un, a, you know, just a Uniswap pool as an oracle, um, there's some proper oracle practices to fix that, but that's been quite interesting as well. I, I just want to point out, these, this, this class of attack, if you want to call it an attack, is really interesting and really fascinating, but I think it's very important to make a distinction between this and other forms of security incidents, because I'm inclined to actually put these sorts of attacks, and I'm, again, I'm using scare quotes, um, into the MEV bucket, right? It's, as you said a moment ago, it's code working as it was intended, and it's, th this is not new. I have a background in high-frequency trading, right? We just call this arbitrage, right? It's people finding mispricings or, um, yeah, it's exactly like you said, when there's some sort of a mispricing or an, or an assumption that's baked in at the interface, it tends to be at the interface of two different kind of systems or something, and, and taking advantage of that, um, I'm not sure I'd call that a security incident like an actual bug in core code or something. So it's important to make that distinction. And by the way, we should talk more about MEV because MEV is also really interesting. This is why I've been using the word attack instead of hack. Yeah, fair, fair. Let's talk about okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make a point that, uh, like, more generally speaking, because smart contracts are immutable, um, when you write smart contract code, it's, it's very unreasonable to imagine, like, I have to write this code so it's a cure for the next 100 years against any future innovation that could possibly happen in DeFi. Like, like a lot of these smart contracts were written before flash loans, lots of came along, people can exploit these smart contracts. Uh, so how do we get around this? Well, it's, like, really difficult, right? Because uh, as we've seen in protocol upgrades, um, sure, the devs can be responsible and kind of up upgrade that to protocol in response to, like, uh, new developments, but there's still like money and assets in the old protocol that can't be withdrawn. And a huge class of attacks comes from people just like not being up to date on what's happening and not withdrawing their money from, from stale protocols. So, I mean, one very classic example was when, when the whole Terra Luna blow up happened. There were so many mispricings everywhere because everyone had some assumptions about the price of Luna on many different chains because everywhere, and then people just wreaking havoc. Uh, I remember Venus Marcus got hit pretty bad by that one. Yeah, I think we see a large number of things where um, in the traditional security world, you, you hear about like the zero day versus the, the well-known exploit that's been out there. Uh, things like the profanity key generator that, yes, if you were the first person, like one, you should have reviewed it. Two, if uh, you were the first person to fall prey to that, yeah, that sucks. 
but everyone else who suffered from that and hundreds of millions of dollars lost after the well-publicized exploit existed and clear way to mitigate it existed, uh, that is um, a failure to stay up to date on, on threat intelligence and, and act quickly, which is a problem of not knowing all the components of your ecosystem, like your asset inventory and um, having a procedure in place for handling this kind of crisis. I don't know if we want to get into that more because the Luna, uh, ex not even exploit, the Luna threat was known for four years publicly and people chose to ignore that and some people weren't informed on that but uh, I don't know if I don't know if it's worth exploring that but um. yeah, I mean a lot of very prominent folks among them like investors security researchers had were very vocal from you know months or even years prior uh, about about this class of, of, of economic attack right because we're talking about an economic attack now uh, and in fact there were warning signs right because there was um, there was a, uh, I, I don't remember the details, but there was an attack six months prior or something against um, one of the other coins or assets or something in the, in the Terra ecosystem, and the price kind of, it, it kind of depegged and then went back. So there were like warning signs ahead of time as well. Yeah, what I, what I found interesting, because I've talked to a lot of people about this incident because it affected a lot of people. Um, so, so can we... Can we recap the incident? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so it is a notable security it incident. It is a notable so. security <laughs> incident. So um, it, it, basically, uh, this Terra Luna um, uh, design protocol was basically, uh, it had a mechanism to mint a, a so-called algorithmic stablecoin uh, where you burn the, the sovereign asset, uh, Luna, in order to mint uh, UST, which is supposed to be pegged to a dollar. And the idea there is that you'll always be able to redeem it for a dollar's worth of Luna, which then gets minted. Um, if this sounds like circular logic, it's because it is. It is. Uh, so many, including myself, have been vocal publicly about the death spiral uh, inevitability of this design. Uh, and I don't think anyone expected it to get as big as it did. But what I find quite interesting is that um, not only did, uh, I would say, people who are less informed in the space, who it is not their job to maybe know better, you know, okay, it's understandable that they didn't understand that would happen, uh, um, and they were kind of sold a risk-free thing that wasn't risk-free. Um, there was very professional traders um, and other people in the industry who also thought that this would not result in a death spiral. They thought it would work, and they were in it. Um, it's, like, it's like looking for a perpetual motion machine. You know, yeah. it kind of keeps moving until it stops. Um, yeah, so I, I, this was, I, I think, another, this was actually, I think, more example of, like, the, the hubris of success right. of the bull market, where everyone was like, oh, we've, like, solved, like, we impossible solved money. financial problems. We've yeah. solved the perpetual motion machine. It's going to work. It's working. And it got just, like, really big. Um, and it was, it was kind of just destined to not work, but... Um, so, so something else that's new since the last DevCon, which, and, and this is actually the, the aspect of the Terra Luna situation that I find the most interesting, this goes back to composability, which we talked about before. It's the intertwined nature, right? It's that we have now assets built on top of assets built on top of assets. And so when one failure occurs, right, three, four years ago, if something broke, it didn't cause this cascade effect throughout the ecosystem. And actually, in the case of Terra Luna, it was across multiple ecosystems, right? I mean, Bitcoin began crashing, and there's a whole reason for that. They had this Terra Luna, sorry, Terra Foundation Guard um, uh, treasury that held Bitcoin. They had to start selling Bitcoin to defend it. But this, um, uh, what's the word for it? This uh, uh, contagion, yeah, the contagion that spreads throughout, like this is a new class of economic risk that didn't exist before. I think we need to understand it better because it will happen again. Well, I think contagion has existed in, in TradFi for quite a while. People are, are well aware of, of contagion, and but you have something like like central banks to kind of like perhaps contain it and and, uh, and limit it, which arguably is, is not good for the long-term economic uh, viability of, of TradFi markets, and perhaps it's better uh, with DeFi for these to kind of play out and just kind of like, it's almost like a forest fire. Just let the, the fire burn everything and then regrow everything versus just kind of keep these like sick trees alive forever like we have in, in Web2. Um, so one thing that I, I want to kind of touch on with the whole Terra Luna incident is, we got already touched on, it's this idea of like the illusion of like security, uh, which was actually very dangerous. We had the LFG reserve, we had people like Jump and Delphi and many prominent people kind of saying, hey, 
We know about debt spiral. We have a handle. We have $6 billion of BTC. We're going to buy everything, and it's going to be fine. And uh, I think many people looked at that and said, okay, well, Jump has a lot of really good quantitative researchers. I assume they did that kind of modeling. I assume they, they ran the numbers, and we're like, okay, this is probably going to work. But it turns out no one knew what they were doing. So how exactly do we, do we like, mitigate this particular uh, class of like, issues? I think it's very dangerous when you have a situation where people know an issue can occur, and then people also think that other people who are very smart also know this quicker. And we see it all the time in smart contracts. Like, when Alameda jumps into a smart contract, I think people tend to assume that because they're in that smart contract, they've audited it and they, they know what's going on, they put $100 million into it, they probably know what's happening. But in reality, there's like several examples where Alameda is just yielded into a smart contract for yield, and there's been critical bugs in that smart contract, which is just kind of insane. Uh, and it just kind of goes to show you that like, yeah, you, you really cannot rely on like reputation and authority in this space to make your decision making, and that makes things very difficult, I think, for the average person working in DeFi, because people who are not experts in these systems rely on experts, and those experts have been shown time and time again to not be doing proper due diligence on their own. Yeah, there's a range of attacks that have happened where the system as designed was a good design, and even as deployed initially was a good deployment. There was, uh, forget which bridge it was, that had nine separate validators that they collapsed. Uh, uh, Ronin? Ronin, Ronin yeah, sorry, Ronin, yes. Yes, uh, they collapsed it down to uh, smaller than the, the blast radius number and... Well, they, so there was four, four validators controlled by the foundation and five were independent. And then there was, basically it was a usability problem. So uh, withdrawals were happening too slowly. So one of the, by the way, the four run by the foundation were like all in the same AWS machine. So they were basically one. And then uh, they convinced a fifth one to give them like temporary permission to like sign for them. So basically five of nine were running on one machine which got compromised. Um, yeah, so that was like, okay, we started with good practices and then like we... The, 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 I think the term yeah. is the normal, normalization of deviance. It's a concept from like aerospace engineering. So one of the interesting things about crypto is, and a lot of people I talk with uh, come up with the same thing, is uh, if you're deploying an immutable smart contract, and there's reasons why you want to be immutable, um, protection from forced upgrades, uh, malicious insider, or everything else. But if you're deploying an immutable system, you're really in the same safety regime as aerospace, nuclear engineering, everything else. Not something similar to normal software engineering. And you need to have procedures in place for, for that kind of um, ecosystem where traditionally you have more, way more design work than you have implementation, lots of review, you have review of your review process, feedback on that, and it's very different than normal software engineering. And that's not really how stuff is built in the broader ecosystem. Just super briefly, as a developer, to speak to this, this is really hard, right? Most of us, when I say us, I mean core developers, but also application developers, we don't have this background or this training. Um, these practices have begun to spread a little bit through the industry, and we do now have folks contributing to projects like Ethereum who have backgrounds in things like aerospace, um, but we need way better education around this stuff. I really strongly agree with that. To that point, um, and to an earlier point about TradFi, uh, in the TradFi world, there's something called ratings agencies. This doesn't exist in crypto. In, in TradFi, you pay professionals to evaluate the risk and give it a rating of a financial asset, not even a security, not even security wise. There's also security ratings and certifications as well. Um, but so we're missing that in crypto. There's no uh, professionals that are actually actively monitoring even the economic risks of these various systems. The thing that DeFi has that TradFi doesn't have is real time transparency and auditability. So if you look to the uh, 2008 uh, housing crisis, um, that was basically you know, a series of packaged and repackaged and repackaged uh, debt instruments that uh, eight layers deep, nobody could see through to what the underlying was, and they just trusted that the ratings agency that gave it an A+, plus, that everything was A+, plus. turned out there was a bunch of you know, F through A uh, debt within that package, uh, which caused people to basically buy risk that they didn't know they were buying. Um, with DeFi, we have that real-time transparency, but what we, we're lacking right now is uh, uh, basically professionals that evaluate that risk and give ratings on it or give metrics on it. Um, so I'm seeing um, the beginnings of that happening. I'm seeing a couple of projects that are focused on becoming this 
Risk Oracle, uh, Risk Engine. Um, so I'm excited for that in the future because you know we will combine this transparency in DeFi with uh, the the various ratings mechanisms or risk evaluation mechanisms that are coming out. Massive, massive, massive opportunity. Seriously, anyone out there who's interested in this stuff, who has a background in finance, who's inclined, this stuff is sorely needed, and there's huge lack of this stuff in the market today. It's a huge opportunity. Like, work on it, talk to us, we'll, we'll help you make sure you're talking to the right people. Yeah, actually, funnily enough, uh, like, talk to him. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so Anti, which was the project I was previously dev on, is essentially trying to do this in a, in a decentralized way. Um, I, I think that one of the issues with having uh, kind of like centralized risk auditors um, is the fact that they are fallible. I'm not saying decentralized risk auditors are perhaps better. It's just the entire system as a whole, I think, uh, is fallible to some level of human error. And any kind of appeal to authority, I think, is kind of dangerous. I mean, just because we have Moody's this B rating doesn't mean that TradFi is, is immune to like contagion and stuff like that. Like, I mean, it, it, it definitely isn't. Like, like the, the, these companies, uh, I guess like uh, the, the issue, the thing you have in TradFi, you don't have in DeFi, sorry, I'm kind of rambling a bit here, is you have this kind of like fail safe mechanism, the central bank, which they're able to kind of rescue everyone in case everyone gets a bit out of control. Uh, and I, I am not sure if, if like Moody's makes things like that much safer. Uh, it's probably better than, than having nothing at all, but it, it definitely is not like ideal solution, and it probably is, is not gonna work uh, that well for, for DeFi where we have no safety net. We probably need something a bit more robust. So the big problems with rating agencies is that they don't have any skin in the game. Right. So what I'm really bullish on is insurance uh, and other types of systems where they're underwriting the risk rating that they're giving. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can do that, whether it's with a regular insurance company, uh, which is what Evertos does, or uh, various DeFi mechanism designs. This is something that I've researched very deeply, and uh, it, seriously, if anybody wants to work on this, come talk to me, because uh, yeah, there, I, I'm aware of some very interesting things there. Yeah, we do underwriting for a lot of problems for technical risk, uh, projects for technical risk and things like that. And the problem of how much can you trust a software audit or a software security review, auditors actually hate the term audit when applied to their, their work product. Uh, but um, how do you trust different firms? And honestly, uh, every firm I've, I've talked to can do great work. The, the thing from an insurance and a reliance perspective is you really need to look at the, the, like the, the worst work that they'll pass and make sure that that is high quality, because if you're going to just blanket trust the um, security review performed by a firm, you really care about their internal quality control process and uh, knowing that if somebody, it's a new system where they're not already expert in it or where perhaps they don't have, their, they're very busy. Um, one of the biggest problems in the security review industry is it takes three to 18 months to get queued up for a security review at a lot of these firms. And as a result, there's a huge pressure to ship um, and then get your review done while it's in production, or get your review scheduled before you're finished building it, in which case you haven't reviewed the system as it's deployed. So one of the critical things that we absolutely as an industry need to improve is better tooling, but also more security professionals in the industry so that we can do more of this stuff in parallel, because every project out there needs to have this work done, and it's a contended resource, and uh, uh, you, you absolutely want to be one of the ones that gets a security review and not one of the ones that's waiting while you get uh, popped. I don't know if we want to touch on something that we've kind of uncovered, which is that technical auditors are basically expected to take on this role of doing an economic audit as well. And they're actually not the best people to do that, right? They've, they've categorized the known economic attacks, but um, for instance, the mango market attack, which just happened yesterday, was a blatant financial oracle manipulation attack. They manipulated, if you're not aware, Mango got drained for about 100 million. Uh, the attacker increased the price of the Mango asset by uh, manipulating the price of Mango across various markets and then borrowed better assets than Mango against that uh, unrealized position. Um, and like the, a technical auditor could have looked through the Mango code and the Mango team is super smart uh, and, and, you know, everyone involved, like, is, is you know, knows what they're doing. Um, but, like, this was a, uh, 
This is a very uh, you know, weird edge case that somebody with a financial risk perspective would have been the only one that would have caught that. Just to be clear, there are folks who specialize in the financial side of things. So shout out to Gauntlet, shout out to Block Science, right? They have tools, uh, they're experts in this, but those are the only two I know of, whereas there's dozens of auditors who are, like you're describing, technical auditors who I think would not have the sophistication to catch this category of bugs. So again, up yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so one thing touching on the economic audit, I, I do know some auditing firms that now do this kind of auditing separately, and actually there are, like for instance, Compound and Aave will, will retain people to do ongoing economic audits, and I think it's very necessary to be able to adjust the parameters of your protocol uh, in some kind of decentralized way, of course, to, ad to adjust for the changing kind of parameters of like what's actually in that protocol. Because otherwise you end up in situations like, for instance, Mango Markets, um, if you're not aware, this is a very capital intensive attack. It took, I think, around five or $10 million of the user own capital to do that attack. And the thing is, like, I think most people looking at Mango Markets are like, oh, this protocol has $10 million in it when it was audited. This Oracle attack is going to be very expensive to pull up. It's not worth it. Once it has $100 million in it, suddenly this Oracle attack becomes very viable. So you actually need like a real time update of these parameters over time to maintain the safety of the protocol. And that's something that's kind of missing, except with like kind of like a tier one or S tier protocols in DeFi right now. Yep. Yeah. I'd say another interesting thing that's happened over the last three years is the rise of the consumer NFT space, which is bringing a lot of new people into the space that, that really are, they're, they're from an art background. They're not people who are software engineers in a lot of cases who th think about systems failures. If, even if they don't think about it from a security perspective, they think about software bugs. Uh, so there's a lot of people who really don't have the, um, the background or the, the experience to, to know what to be afraid of just sort of like naturally. And we haven't built, as an industry, the, the right tools to make it safe for people to do things without understanding all the details of how it works. Like, uh, there's a lot of people who drive cars who don't know that much about how airbags work and seat belts and everything else. They just know that if you do it, you're probably okay within certain parameters. We are nowhere near that level of uh, um, professionalism and reliability in the, in the space. And we'll see all these people that are, that are new to crypto because of, they've come in through the NFT world and they fall prey to the same issues that, that happened to early regular crypto users uh, 10 years ago and are largely mitigated by community knowledge and, and tooling there. So it's kind of scary that there's the, the high end of these DeFi vulnerabilities, which are new classes of attacks, but some of the most basic things are happening to a new class of users right now as well. So I, th I think a notable security incident along these lines is like owners of board apes revealing their private keys to social engineers on their Discord and losing their apes. Um, you know, I, I think you're right, Ryan. I think like it's incumbent upon us as designers and builders in this space to like build better tools and, 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 and install some of those safety rails or airbags like you're talking about. But I just want to highlight that as someone who thinks deeply about this and, and has been working on this for years, there's a tension here, right? Because the easiest way to install safety rails is centralization, right? Is to say, yeah, you know, for my grandma, like maybe she's not gonna really effectively manage her private keys. Maybe she's not really gonna understand a ledger or a multi-sig. So maybe the best thing for her to do is keep her crypto on Coinbase and, and outsource custody to someone else. And that in some respects is antithetical to like the whole reason we're here. So there's no easy solution to this, but I just wanna highlight that tension. And that's where I approach this as a protocol engineer and as a, as a developer. Yeah, I think kind of a good balance between this is that the base protocol should always stay true to like the tenets of crypto. It should be decentralized, such a persistent, uh, permissionless, all this stuff. So people can build what is on top of that. And I think that it's kind of on us to educate people on the right way to onboard themselves. Like grandma should not be probably creating a MetaMask wallet. I think that's generally something that is, is, uh, is difficult to secure, I think, for the vast majority of people. Uh, and in the current situation, as we see with the NFT space, that uh, like there's no way we can onboard a billion people into crypto with the current state. Like people, uh, like it's just like, it's just gonna create like a feeding frenzy for the piranhas that are constantly looking for ways to steal people's money. So we need to figure out these more robust wallet systems for these people. Uh, and I think that's probably a, a better compromise. We, we onboard people through like, let's say account abstraction wallets or, or some kind of like non-custodial wallet solution with the a uh, hypervisor protocol layer which manages signing and policy networks, and then we keep kind of like the more bare metal, like quote unquote riskier, but more permissionless wallets for people who need them. Yeah. But one of the things that scares me is, while these, these losses might be relatively law, uh, small um, dollar values relative to the larger uh, DeFi protocol hacks and things like that, uh, the number of victims is very high, and politically, 
if you have a lot of victims that individually, like a loss event of any kind, and it makes it very easy for regulators to point it at like a grandmother who's lost uh, something or at otherwise uh, unsophisticated user who is, fell prey to some, some system or possibly was scammed and then pushed for regulation. So we have the centralization risk as a, as a the, the potential to use centralization as a countermeasure to a lot of this stuff is a risk of centralization, but also acquiring a very, very bad public relations nightmare as well as regulatory nightmare is also an existential threat to the, the overall industry. Cool, do we want to open up for Q&A? How are you? Excellent call. Well, uh, no. You talked a little bit about account construction, uh, so I want to know if you could uh, talk a little bit about that, because I think that it's like the solution to have like easier custodial systems without depending on, I mean self-custodial systems without depending on centralized entities, so what do you think about that and how we are advancing, and when do you think we will be able to have that for the general public? So I, I think uh, there's like two classes of account abstraction. Um, so th just to define the term very generally, account abstraction is essentially um, when you make no distinction between smart contracts and individual wallets. On Ethereum right now, individual wallets are fundamentally different than smart contracts because individual wallets are, are public, private key pairs. Smart contracts are, are derived very differently. And I don't necessarily have time to go into that right now. But in account abstraction, they're basically the same. Smart contracts, individual wallets are smart contracts. And we have the ability to do that right now with things like like multi-sigs, which obviously are, are somewhat valuable. And in the future, we may eventually end up doing, uh, doing away with the distinction entirely. So people with roll-ups were trying to do that, but eventually ended up deciding not to because uh, you know, it, it, making these kind of protocol level changes just made it very difficult for Ethereum developers to kind of compose and build on them. Um, but the nice thing about kind of abstraction is the design space is, is very wide. People could do things like multi-sigs, they can do things that are much more complicated, like have like off-chain oracles and you know, involve human beings in the process and do basically kind of the sky is the limit in terms of what people are kind of building here. Um, one interesting project that's kind of, uh, actually never mind. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's we, not quite a, yeah. So we built this for Space Mesh. Okay, we built account abstraction. I think we may be the first layer one, maybe the second. Near has something similar. Uh, it was really, 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 really hard. To your point, it, it, it had very deep, profound implications and ramifications on the protocol. Uh, but it's a very powerful primitive, and it means that the really simple way to think about this is every account by default is a multi-sig, and there's always multiple keys associated with it. Again, this is also the case in Near. So shout out to Near for for kind of like pioneering some of this work. It's a very important primitive, and I think it will go a long way towards addressing some of the kind of classes of attacks we discussed here. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, which security incident, in your opinion, was the most impactful, not in terms of value lost, but in terms of sending ripples across the ecosystem? Uh, I'm, okay, I, the first one that came to my mind, this actually touches upon a point that Ryan made a moment ago, which is that it's not necessarily, as you said as well, about the total amount of funds, um, but it has more to do with the, the number of people impacted and the sophistication of those people. Um, there was a hack in a Solana ecosystem wallet about four or five months ago. Does anyone remember the name of the wallet? Slope Wallet, thank you. Uh, and what happened here was a bug in the wallet that exposed the private keys because of some telemetry kind of tooling uh, very common, I think it was called Sentry or something. I think we actually use it in, in Space Mesh as well. And the reason that I find this one so impactful is because this was, the actual total number of funds was very small and I think it was eight or $10 million worth or something. So it was like, maybe even less than that, but it was thousands of users who were impacted and each of them had a very small amount of money in their wallets and they woke up one day and their funds were gone. That I don't think has ever happened before, that particular class of attack and everyone was panicking and very no scary. one knew. Yeah, it was a very scary attack. Even scarier about that is no one knew which wallet it was right. because a lot of people were reusing seed phrases across multiple wallets. So they thought it was a Solana base level vulnerability or something. It wasn't even localized to a wallet. It was very scary watching that in real time. Just PSA, because apparently it needs to be said, do not log private keys into your logger. Yeah, and, and also use hardware wallets, okay? This, this class of attack is not possible with a hardware wallet. That too. Um, I think probably the most impactful on the space has been the combination of the UST collapse, which led to the Three Arrows collapse, which led to an entire uh, collapse of the crypto credit markets and has really raised a lot of red flags with regulators. Like we've seen a lot of regulatory pushes because of that combination of UST and Three Arrows. Um, and that has impacted a lot of uh, 
you know, non-crypto native folks who are sold a risk-free USD interest rate. Um, so it, it did happen to be a large dollar value, but it's having heavy political ramifications. For the final remark, yeah. Aaron. Uh, plus one for UST. <laughs> plus one for Solana. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. This was really, I learned a lot. I hope you guys did too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much to everyone else on the panel.